Welcome to Blowing Up Gas Stations for Fun and Profit. The title is meant to be a joke. Please don't go around blowing stuff up that you don't own. And even if you do own, it's quite dangerous. So let's get started. What are ATGs? That's, that's what we are going to find out during this talk, uh, how they are used. Uh, the agenda for today, will, I will talk about past research that the security researchers did. Uh, I will talk about new issues that, that, that I found. Uh, how the disclosure process of a bunch of vulnerabilities went, which was also uh, interesting, and then my quest for actual physical damage uh, and some conclusions. Now, anyone here heard about ATGs in the past? Uh, I don't see a lot of hands. Uh, so an ATG is an ICI system that's used to measure and record parameters of, of big fuel tanks. Uh, it measures uh, fuel levels, water condensation, temperature, things like that. It's also used to monitor leaks. Uh, it can uh, trigger uh, outside uh, processes, like trigger alarms, emergency shutdown valves, ventilation, fuel dispensers, stuff like that. Uh, they are very uh, widely used for inventory management. So they, they warn some central point there's a need for refueling, so the refueling trucks can come and refuel the, the big gas tanks. And they are uh, critical for compliance uh, for environmental regulation. So in the US, for example, if you have a big enough fuel tank, you are required to have an ATG to understand if, if there's a leak. They are monitored. There's an inspection coming to see if all the parameters uh, check out and they don't have any leaks. So as you would expect, you find a lot of these systems at gas stations, but it's not the only use case. Uh, hospitals, airports, military facilities, telcos, wherever you have a big enough uh, backup generator system that needs a big enough uh, fuel tank, you can find ATGs also. Now, uh, I work for BitSight. Uh, if you know BitSight, you know that we are scanning the internet back and right. Uh, <clears throat> why are we researching into ATGs? Well, we all know that <clears throat> cyber critical, uh, critical infrastructure sectors have come to rely heavily on ICS, uh, and ICS is not like any other piece of software. You can't just go around and scanning ICS devices back, back and left. One of the reasons is, first of all, probably if you don't speak the right protocol, you don't have answer. And you have to be extra careful so you won't crash the device. And that's, that's something that we don't want to do, right? Uh, during some of the research, I, f I found that the, the ATG protocol had some prevalence. It, it, it became an interesting target for me for several reasons. Another reason was this is not a theoretical threat. There are proofs that these systems are currently being hacked in cyber warfare scenarios. The voltage of Team One Fist publishes regularly uh, photos of ICS systems that they attack. And this is an example of uh, one of the systems which, which I, I found a vulnerability. I don't know which vulnerability they, they were exploiting here, if any. Anyway. We will talk about two kinds of ATG devices. There's what we will call the ATG protocol speaking devices or old devices. Uh, not all of them are old, but these are devices that actually speak the ATG or Zilbarco or TLS protocols. Depending on, on the literature, they, they, they issue different names, but it's the same protocol. And this protocol has been shown that it's not secure by default. It's an insecure protocol, shouldn't be exposed to the internet. And then we will talk about the other ATG devices, the new new devices, the ones that uh, I started to look at as they don't speak usually the ATG protocol, but I ha they have some sort of web interface or other interfaces to be controlled and monitored, uh, which I found also a bunch of vulnerabilities. Now, the legacy protocol uh, is really legacy. Uh, the, the security issues were mentioned back in 2015, so 10 years ago by HD Moore and Jack Shadowitz. The protocol is open by default, and essentially what they did was, uh, this protocol was designed for the serial port, and what they did was they just put a serial to IP converter and connect these devices to the internet. So you are actually speaking serial to an IP address, which is usually not a good idea. So. The, 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 the vendors actually recognized this was, a, this was an issue. There was potential exploitation impact, like resizing the tank information might, might cause an overfill. If you say that a tank can hold more fuel than it actually has, when the refueling person goes to refuel, 
you might not have enough time to shut down the refueling process and there's a spillage. So if you spill diesel, you have one implication. If you spill gasoline or plain fuel, the risks are considerably higher for a, for, for a fire. Then you can shut down the dispensing or shut down the leak detection. Um, you can easily reconfigure the, the network card so you have a, a denial of service situation and you can delete like the, the, the compliance data that's stored in the devices so when, the, when there's a fiscalization there's no proof that the leak detecting was working so you get fines and they're usually quite big. So it's not a good idea to have this protocol on the internet. Have things changed since 2015? Yes. For better, no. So uh, there were approximately 5,880 Gs expo uh, exposed without a uh, security code or a password on the internet in 2015. Last month, I found 6,500, uh, excluding the gas pots. There's a lot of honey pots uh, out there. Um, the probes I designed, they, they uh, avoid the, the gas pots. And those were the ones without security codes at all. But there's an option to put a security code. It's actually an optional six-digit code that you can prepend to, to a message. And we'll get to that and why that kind of sucks. Um, moving forward. So I have to be a bit fast. So there's several methods for fingerprinting this. Uh, the port 10001 is not the only port that, that usually has ATG devices. There's, there are more ports. Uh, you can explore like quirks on the TCP IP stack to increase the success of detecting an ATG device even if it's not speaking to you. Um, I can get to that uh, later. Uh, but essentially this, this is important because one of the reasons sometimes these systems aren't detected it could be because they have a, a password or security code and the protocol by definition states there should be no reply. So you don't, you don't have an idea when you connect to that port if something is behind that port or not unless you, you send the right security code. So I was wondering, maybe the 6,500 devices that I'm seeing uh, is just a small portion and maybe most of the devices are password protected, for example. So statistics to the rescue. What, what I did was I scanned the same IP address space uh, and I, I just sent the top 10 six-digit pin uh, password. As we see in this study, understanding human chosen pins, Imagine one, two, three, four, five, six is the single most used six digit password. Nobody would, would have guessed. Um, it, it goes around 10% of those password, of, of all those passwords of six digit pins. It's this code. I send this code to all the, the scanning IP address spaces. I got 57 instances. You do some quick maths. Could be completely off, but, uh, you can think about, you know, times 10. Uh, devices that are password protected by inferring the, the, the whole uh, space. Could be two or three times more, maybe yes. Ten times more, it's unlikely. I, I do believe that that security code is the most uh, used six-digit pin. So the, the space is bigger, but not a lot bigger. Now, what about the, the newer devices, those that, those that don't speak the ATG protocol? Uh, some of them also support, you can turn on the, the, this ADG protocol support uh, for legacy reasons, of course. And they mostly rely on some sort of web interface to be controlled, monitored. So what you end up with is a device that speaks the old protocol, which is vulnerable, and then you have, uh, uh, you know, another uh, entry point, which is the web interface, so you're actually expanding your attack surface. We, for an attacker, that's great because you, you can search for more vulnerabilities, right? And that's kind of what happened. Uh, in one week, I found 11 uh, critical vulnerabilities, almost all of them, in six different ADG systems from five different uh, vendors. And what's concerning here for me is not the amount of new vulnerabilities found, but the flaw types that kind of reflect the, what's going on on the ICS sector in general. Like we have previous pre presentations here stating, hey, I found this very simple ICS vulnerability. Uh, and whenever I talk to uh, folks that do ICS security research, we have the same kind of complaints. Flaws are very basic. We have a presentation here that knows that. So 
Uh, the majority of those obey what's called the unforgivable, unforgivable vulnerability criteria, and we get to that. Some of these vulnerabilities, you can see that they have been fixed or attempt to be fixed, but not a complete fix. Others were designed as features, for example, hard-coded credentials. It seemed like a good idea at the time, probably to do some remote administration, right? So, but they weren't, and I will run through them uh, in a bit. The, just, just as an example of the prevalence of these new uh, issues for these new brands, they are heavily focused on the on U.S., Brazil, and, and Thailand. There are some cases in Europe too. Some models seem to be exclusive uh, sold in Europe, others in the U.S. But you get the picture. There's a bunch of them. Now I won't go into details of each vulnerability. I just run through them uh, a bit fast. So OS command injection. It's Classic injection on network diagnostics, if you play with routers, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Art-coded credentials, you know, undeletable super administrator on the devices, uh, passwords that were just too elite for someone to have guessed them. Um, authentication bypass were mostly authentication logic on, on the browser and client side, what could possibly go wrong there. SQL injection with full error logs, um, I won't go into this one, this is boring. Uh, you know, anonymous uh, admin page access won't work, but if you're logged in as a guest, you can access the entire interface. Those types of privilege escalations. And, you know, direct file read, it's not even path traversal, you don't have to do nothing, just state the, the file that you want to download. Those types of issues. I do think they fit the criteria for the unforgivable vulnerability. I'll just go about the criteria really fast. Precedent. So many other developers have made the same mistake in the past. Check. Documentation. Is there, you know, books, articles, educational materials that highlight this problem? Check. Are they obvious? Well, yes. Uh, are they simple to exploit? Apparently so. Can they be found in five minutes? Five minutes is a very limited time, let's, let's be honest, but uh, some of them, yes. Uh, I don't think found in five is a very, very uh, strong criteria. If it's found in 10, I think it also uh, fits the unforgivable vulnerability criteria. Now, if either of you ever try to responsible disclose a vulnerability, you know there are challenges, right? You have this vulnerability, uh, you try to contact the vendor, uh, the, um, you know, sometimes there's language barriers, sometimes you can't get to the right folk behind that, that understands your language that, where you can explain the vulnerability. Sometimes the vendor doesn't want to speak with you because they are hiding. So there's a lot of uh, different approaches that the vendors take that can make this process frustrating when you're disclosing one vulnerability. Now. If you're trying to disclose 11 vulnerabilities on six different systems and five different vendors, it's a good idea to get some help because it's, it's going to be hard, okay? So what we chose was uh, work with one of our partners, the EGS CISA, and they would, they would be, they, would, they, would, they had been really helpful in the past with other vulnerabilities and they really helped coordinate all the entire process, figuring out who's the responsible parts, on those companies, trying to understand who can we talk to and, and act as a mediator so we, we would interact with, with all those companies that were behind the, those systems. And we first disclosed the vulnerabilities uh, back in March. It took six, it was a six long, six month long process, unusually long, but there were a lot of vulnerabilities. There were legacy systems that there, there was no fix, so we wanted to make sure everybody had enough time to reach out to the users, fix the vulnerabilities, and, and turn the world a slightly better place, hopefully. So the vulnerabilities became public uh, in September, and that was it. My quest for physical damage uh, was a bit different, so that, that's me wondering if I will bring the device to the presentation, but the probe is actually way bigger than me, and it will be very hard to travel with it, so I decided, uh, I, I brought the, the ATG, but not, not the probe. Now, how can we go deeper uh, to understand what happened if those systems are, are, are abused, and why should we do that? As an attacker, I always think about worst case scenario, right? We, we're, we try to uh, push the boundaries of what we can do with this type of systems. 
And in cyber physical systems, it, systems that can actually have an impact on the physical world, uh, that's usually where we go for. We want to we want to want to know how how much can we stretch and how much processes can we influence. Just you know because. There were many ideas I had that I could not test. Uh, you know, I don't own a gas station, so I, I cannot go around and test those things. Blowing things up is bad, but I'll show you some living off the land techniques and how the legacy protocol still strikes back. Now, going deeper and what can happen. So the ATG, if you can see it on the top middle, is just a part of a big system that has a lot of uh, sensors, it has actuators. Uh, if you get, you know, administered administrative access, uh, the denial of service is quite trivial, you just, you know, uh, change the network settings, or you can flash or, or corrupt the, the, the operating system, that will make the devices to work, but it's not very funny, it doesn't make the, the gas station explode, that's, that was my target. So what could, can you aim for? You can aim for the sensors, or you can aim for the actuators. So aiming for the sensors, you can, uh, in, interfere with how the sensors are communicating the, the readings to, to the ATG. Somehow, uh, ChatGPT thinks a refueling um, truck has some tubes on the front side. I don't know what's going on there. Um, so, uh, but resizing the, the, the tank information has the same direct impact that messing around with the sensors. Messing with the sensors uh, implies that you, you probably have to write some, some code that's very specific to that architecture, so it's way easier just to resize the tank information because the end result will be the same. You're looking for some, some spillage. You're looking to have the, the, the reaction time reduced for the technician that's the refilling, and, and that could have a, a, a spillage as, as an effect, and that's, that's the dangerous situation when you end up with a, with a floor full of, of gasoline, and that ca that can really have an impact. Um, there was also suggestions by other technicians. I actually spoke with technicians that do this for a living. They install these ATG systems, and they have no idea about cybersecurity. It's not their, their, their thing. And they were warning about the potential issue of just simulating problems in the ATG on and off that would cause and trigger uh, an intervention. There has to be like a certified technician going to the installations, and there's not a lot of them in the US. If you attack at scale, if, you, if there's like 500 of those uh, issues at the same time in the US, there won't be enough technicians to go to all, all things. So it, it, will have, it will have a big impact too. So experts are concerned, not necessarily for the same reasons I, I was when I was trying to blow up a gas station. Now, Aiming for the actuators is where the fun kind of begins. So if, if the ATGs can control processes, uh, how do they do it? They usually do it because they have an internal relay board and sometimes external relay boards too. They have relays that can be activated and configured in different ways to, to achieve different um, actions, like turning on pumps, turning on the dispensing, uh, ventilation system, so the relay abuse seems like the most obvious attack for me at the time. And you can actually, opening up those ATGs, you can find like the specs for each relay. A mechanical relay has electrical and mechanical characteristics that you can search. And if you find out how fast you can switch them, you can have a good idea when they will fail because you actually have them, the, the test has been done in, by, by the vendor itself. So how to abuse relays? Well, switching on and off as fast as possible, and you get a light bulb, which is pretty cool. This is, uh, you cannot hear the sound maybe? So this is actually a, a relay that, that exists on that ADG that I've shown, that, that, I, that I've brought with, with me. I'll, I'll play this again. I just removed it from, from the board uh, because I didn't want, well, ATGs are very expensive. I didn't want to break the board, just test the relay for the idea. So, for example, in the Maglink uh, LX4, you can use living off the land techniques because you have I2C tools. The relays are actually controlled uh, via I2C in, in this particular ATG. So you can just use a while loop, turning them on and off as fast as they can. They, they would cycle at uh, around 50 uh, times per, per second, which is way off specs. So the way that you achieve this attack varies because the ATGs are constructed differently, 
And some models below, that's the commands that you can use to achieve different things. I don't mention the models because these are more zero days on other things that aren't revealed yet, but um, there are tools uh, of living off the land tools that you can use like JPEG to uh, frame buffer where you can actually replace the the entire screen by an image that, that you want so the operator can even trust what's on the screen because you can just replace it on the fly. So there's a lot of uh, potentially attack scenarios. Now, oh, this again. Okay. So what about the old protocol? Can you do this with the old protocol? Well, you cannot turn relays on and off using the old protocol per specification. What you can do is you can rec reconfigure the relay board and you can tell the device, hey, this relay should be normally open or this relay should be normally closed. And what it does is the software then checks the current state and if it's not how it should be, it actually toggles the, the relay. So you just reconfigure the relay and you achieve the same result which is toggle the relay on and off uh, and the, the software does it by itself. It's really easy, it's, uh, it's just a script. So you can actually do it. It will be a lot slower because there's the network lagging effects, but if you do this on the long run, the, the relay might not, uh, it, it will not probably uh, light up, but it will eventually break down because it's turning, it's, it's being uh, um, degraded, right? So <clears throat> in a nutshell, is physical damage possible? Yes, it is, either directly, like I show, like the mechanical relays uh, can be worn off and they can be damaged. But furthermore, what's connected to those peripherals, to those relays, I'm pretty sure probably it, if there's something that they're connected, it will break down faster than the relay itself. If there's a pump there turning on and off really fast, the pump won't like it or the HVAC system won't like it. Something bad will happen. I, again, I haven't tested because I don't own a gas station. But uh, it's a possibility. And the physical damage is possible indirectly. You don't control all the factors, uh, but we, we, we saw that, you know, changing geometry can, can lead to spillage, and that's a dangerous situation. But you can also ca cause damage to other devices. Imagine a, a gas station where you actually change the tank information, switching diesel for gasoline, and then you have all cars filling up with diesel that work on gasoline. So you, you're causing damage in the vehicles that get refilled and not, not the gas station itself. So there's, there's an endless uh, potential for damage here. Now, conclusions. ATGs are usually part of critical infrastructure. Uh, there are more ATG systems, or we see more ATG systems than, than reported 10 years ago. Uh, they have an increased attack surface because they suffer from old issues and modern issues. There doesn't seem to be a lot, uh, a lot of investment in security in the systems. And when physical damage is proven to be possible, we, we really should, should work on this. Um, they are distributed around the world. You can see Luxembourg is a fan of the TLS 450, which is an issue. Um, yeah, what can you do to drive change? So if you're a security professional, please get these devices off the internet. They, they, they don't belong there. Put them behind a firewall. That's, that's step one. It doesn't solve all the problems. doesn't solve local, local attacks, but at least they are not reachable via the internet. And that's, that's, that's a start. Uh, if you're a manufacturer, secure by design principles, you know, supply chain, cybersecurity principles, there are actually manufacturers that are building programs that detect uh, misconfigured and exposed systems of their own uh, end users, and they are trying to actively do the outreach and try to fix things, uh, you can build a program like that. And if you're a policymaker, you should understand that there are risks. Uh, you should quantify the impact, the financial impact. Usually money makes things move, so if, if you have a clear understanding of the potential risk and financial impact of those things, maybe you can start legislating and, and make, make, make change happen. Um, and that's it. Uh, uh, yes. I have a question. Okay. Can I ask it? Of course. So we recently saw something with supply chain attacks and pagers, right? Yes. The probe you were showing on the picture looked interesting. What would happen if a threat actor got control of the probe production facility yeah. and issued a, a recall for existing probes and distributed tampered probes and then you used your living off the land off and on? Off. What, what would the result be? 
I think you already know the answer. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> so if you work with ICSOT, if you look at ATG security before and, or work on the fuel industry, or especially if you own a gas station, please reach out. I would uh, I would be very interesting to <laughs> to work with you. Um, Thank yes. you so much for this presentation. It's very interesting. <laughs> um, I have one question about the ATG protocol. I'm not very familiar with it, but I guess it's used for um, at least controlling and monitoring uh, tank gauges. Um, so you said that in newer versions, they don't use this protocol anymore. Do, did we replace it with another protocol? Uh, some versions actually support the protocol, but it's off by default. But there's a bunch of different protocols that they support. Uh, some of them, I, I still don't know what they are. They're quite obscure, but others seem to be more uh, used by, by the industry. So you can actually choose which protocols you want to speak when you, when you want to integrate your, this solution with, with other systems. But the, the web interface seems, seems to be like the default thing that uh, all those devices that, that I've shown uh, have turned on to be configured and, and, and monitored and so forth, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, I got a simple question. You got a zero day, you got a patch. How do you deploy the patch on these devices? Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question that you should ask the vendors. But I, I can give you uh, an idea. It's, it's hard, you know. Patching ICS systems is hard. Some of these vulnerabilities were found on real old and legacy devices that after a lot of months considering, the vendor just decided it's not possible anymore to we d probably they don't even have the code anymore. The guy that wrote it died or something, right? So uh, it's, it's how old those things are. So they are not going to, to, to make a, a patch for uh, a, a system that old and they just discontinue. Recommendations are kind of the same I, 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 I've made, like take them off the internet, put them behind some corporate firewall, or you know, buy the new device where these things, you know, the old issues don't don't happen, just the new ones. <laughs> but it's a hard problem, that's for sure. Anything else for Petal? Are you all thinking about coffee or tea? All right. Well, thanks, Petal. Thank you.